We are in uh, 2 Samuel 11 this morning. Please turn with me there in your pew Bibles. 2 Samuel 11, we'll look at the whole passage there, verses 1 through 27. Uh, It is good to be back uh, looking at David's life and those figures that were key in his journey. And we turn our eyes today to a real unexpected aspect of David's life. The man who was described as the man after God's own heart. A figure chosen by God who exemplified faith and worship. A man who is so great in the sight of God that Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, is called the Son of David. There's an aspect of his life that is unexpected. And that is um, an area of sin. So we turn our eyes together. 2 Samuel 11, verses 1 through 27. Hear the word of God. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and slept, and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanliness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab. Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. When David was told Uriah didn't go home, he asked him, haven't you come from a distance? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my master Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open fields. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? They surely as You live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat Among his master's servants, he did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. While Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, When you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up, and he may ask you, Why did you get so close to the city to fight? Don't you know they shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Bimelech, son of Jerub Besheth? Didn't a woman throw a millstone from the wall so that he died in Thebes? 
Why, didn't, why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, then say to him, also your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. Messenger sent out, and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had sent him to say. The messenger said to David, The men overpowered us and came out against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance to the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall, and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. David told the messenger, Say this to Joab, Don't let this upset you. Don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that your word is living and active and continues to reveal you to us, continues to teach us, continues to instruct us, continues to bless us, continues to call us to a different standard in a culture that in so many ways turns away from you. And Lord, we ask today that you would make clear to us what you want us to see. Thank you that you are a God that is rich in mercy and love and forgiveness, but that calls us to a standard that reflects you as the master, the Lord, the king of our lives. And we are very grateful, Lord, for this word and this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, our dear friend Don Muma served with Billy Graham in the 50s. And um, I asked him about Billy Graham who really is remembered as one of the greatest Christian figures in the last hundred years. And he said, and he says, Billy Graham was not the smartest guy. He was not the, um, not the most profound. But he was very, very clear on his principles. Billy Graham never spent one night on the road away from home alone in his room. He always had a roommate. He always had accountability. He always had safeguards to protect himself against scandal or against attack. And as a result, Billy Graham is remembered as truly a godly, amazing servant of the Lord. Because he was strong in his morality and his convictions and in his safeguards to protect himself against attack. And I look, especially in the Christian world, there are so many powerful leaders who have fallen because of sin. And and, and the way that that affects their witness. Joel, I'm getting a lot of buzz back here from these monitors, if you could tone those guys down. It's like I got got critters back here yipping at me. It's like... All right, that's, sounds good. It's like a peanut gallery back there. Oh, really? Um, no, you're good. No, it's good. Um, and that, that struck me a lot because so many people, when they become well-known and successful and wealthy, can begin to operate as if they've got it all figured out as if they're untouchable. And it's those people who often fall because they let their guard down to mistakes, to bad choices. It's amazing to me that David, who's described, I mean, really, we think about the the people of the Old Testament, and there are some great prophets, 
but I don't think anyone stands out as much as David to the point where God names the Savior of the world as David's son. And we look here, and we see a complete monster. Are, are, are we right? I mean, am I missing anything here? We see a complete monster who has been empowered by God and given everything he could want, and yet he makes a choice to do something incredibly evil. And it makes me think about, for us, what is the reality? What is the reality that we can learn from here when it comes to David? The scripture is very interesting. It talks about how, how all the soldiers, when it's a time when all the kings and soldiers went out to battle, David stayed home. So David had something he was supposed to be doing, but he chose to do something else. He chose to not be where he should be and to wander. And he allowed himself the potential for trouble. We see that, that he sends Joab off and he's, and he's wandering around the palace. In a sense, he's looking for something to do. And he looks out from his rooftop and he sees a very beautiful woman bathing. Now, even today, if a lot of us men saw a very beautiful woman bathing, we'd have some thoughts. And in those days, women were completely covered. They wore fabric from here down to the toes, even veils over the faces. So the fact that she was out in the open and he saw her is very, very unique. Some commentators, you read and they say she was just going about her business and lo and behold, King David's eyes fell upon her. Others believe when you think about how the layout of the city would have been, you have all these, you know, in flat land neighborhoods, all these neighborhoods here and you've got these yards with fences on them and yet there's one balcony higher than everybody else's. The palace. Do you think that potentially she knew who walked on that rooftop? Could she know the only person that would walk on that rooftop would be the king? I mean, I'm telling you, if your neighbor was the president, I think you'd know. And I think you'd know which house was his. When we talk about modesty, which I think oftentimes get lost, gets lost. You know, um, our house has, uh, has windows in it, and my wife was very modest. Even when we know the windows you can't see through, she still closes the, the blinds. You know what I mean? She takes extra precautions. No one's ever going to see her through those windows, ever. You know, and certainly could Bathsheba have put up a, a curtain or worn something into that water and then worn it out? There's potential for that. We're not saying it's her fault. But certainly, her awareness of where David walked and who her neighbor was certainly made her one that you could say was hoping to catch the eye of the ruler. So we learn about modesty here. She knew she was very beautiful, and the king sees her, and he calls her in, and she lies with him. And some say, but wait a minute, pastor, she could not have denied him. But I think she could have. She could have said, Oh no, my Lord, you are so wonderful, but you know my husband. Uriah the Hittite was one of David's 30 mighty men. One of his great soldiers. And he was a foreigner who had forsaken his gods, had forsaken his gods and, he, and he came and he, and he acknowledged the God of Israel, the one true God, as his God. And we see in this scripture that he was more a man after God's own heart than David was. David is sitting at home chasing other men's wives while Uriah is saying, no, no, while my fellow soldiers are out in the field, I will not partake of the pleasantries. You see the difference? And he is the foreigner. She 
She comes in. He invites her in. She sleeps with him. She probably loves the idea of being the king's wife. And he sends her back. She could have denied him. Uh, Joseph denied Potiphar's wife as a slave and he got put in jail. But he didn't compromise his morality. I don't think that David was going to put her in jail if she said no. And then we have David. That's, so that, that, that's Bathsheba over here. Then we have David. Do you think David knew who his neighbors were? Do you think he knew who resided in those houses that were just over his back porch? It tells us that, again, Uriah was one of David's mighty men. Of course, he would have known their families, and her father was one of his chief advisors. He knew which one Bathsheba was, and I'm guessing that she stood out, as she is described as very beautiful. And we see here with David a series of events. You know, I don't think that anyone sets out to sin badly. Do you? I don't think anyone sets out to do things that go against God's heart or that hurt other people. I, mean, I don't think people do that. But I think what happens is we begin to compromise in areas that we shouldn't. Does this make sense? We begin to say, you know what? I know it's not so good, but really, it's not going to hurt anybody if I look at that or if I do that. Or, and pretty soon, we have made compromises and we get ourselves into a point that's really hard to get out of. We see it with Christian believers all the time. You know, I, I have seen and known a number of pastors who have fallen into sexual sin. And it's always the same thing. Well, you know, I, I wasn't appreciated at home, or no one understood me, and then Susie so-and-so came in, and she told me how wonderful I was. And I don't know about you, but a lot of guys and women like to know how wonderful they are. I see how it becomes tempting, if we're not careful. I mean, how many of us really would say no if we're in a bad place in our current relationship and someone else comes in and says, hey, look how great it can be. The grass is always greener on the other side. Does that make sense? Are you with me? It's hard. Unless we're intentional and we safeguard ourselves. Unless we help ourselves have boundaries and unless we make a stance that we're not going to fall into sin. We talk a lot in this church about identity and value and hope and faith, and those things are all well and good, and they need to be a part of our lives, but God has called us to a higher standard. We cannot experience the fullness of God's blessing and direction and goodness if we cannot get away from falling less than into sin. I have known so many people that were on fire for God, and they came to the point where it's going to be, am I going to choose the sin in my life, or am I going to choose God? And when they chose this way, this suffered or died. We can't have both. We can't coexist with both. By nature, God is righteous and holy, and sin is not. And we're invited. We're given a great opportunity to say no to the compromise and yes to God's intention. Yes to his plan. We see in Genesis 3 when the snake tempts Eve, it says that she looked on the fruit and she desired it. It's that same word that we have for lust. It's something that happened with David and Bathsheba. He looked on her and she was very beautiful and he wanted her for his own. And this goes beyond sexual sin. This is, this is every area of sin. We find a temptation and it leads us to compromise. And the problem that I see so often times is people make that compromise and then they're unwilling to repent from the wrong they've made. And instead of repenting, they try to justify it. Right? We begin to justify the sin because we like it. If we didn't like it, it wouldn't be hard to get away from. Right? Some of you are looking at me funny right now. This is a big thing.
I, ha- I have seen people compromise in sin, and it kills. It kills their walk with God. It kills their faith when they're not willing to repent. I mean, David, at every turn, he could have stopped what he was doing. He could have changed his way when he found out. First of all, when he first saw her, he should have said, not good for me right now. There was no benefit for looking at the naked woman in the bath. But he stopped and he desired her. And then we see him use his power. This word send is all throughout this passage. He sends for a servant. He sends to find out who she is. Then he sends for her. He's using his power. God has given him gifts. And instead of using them for God's kingdom, he's using them for his lust. He's abusing that which God gave him to rule his people. And he sends, he sends, he finds out who she is. And right then, oh, it's Uriah's wife. Oh, I'm so sorry. I've got to send Uriah a letter and a gift basket with fruit. He could have done that. He could have sent her a letter, Bathsheba, please forgive me. I saw you by a mistake in the bath. And, oh, that was not a good move by me. And things would have been forgiven. But, but he let that desire for, what he, for, for sin take over his decision-making process, and then he brought her to him, right? And then even once she's pregnant, he has the opportunity to say, oh, I have done wrong, and invite Uriah in and say, Uriah, I have done this horrible sin. Please forgive me. And he could have been forgiven. But instead, he goes even further and kills the man who's loyal to him. And we talk about the people say, oh, well, you know, it's not sin if nobody gets hurt, right? How bad can it be if nobody gets hurt? But David, because he was unwilling to do what was right and kept doing what was wrong, hurt a lot of people. Uriah lost his life, and he was nothing but righteous, nothing but good. And I think it's so easy, I, I share this with you because I think it's so easy for us to begin to compromise, to begin to, to look the other way because we want something and, and we can find ourselves in a very, very difficult, hurtful place. But there's always that invitation to turn. And I think that the Christian church can never be what God has called it to be unless we can turn ourselves away from what is not of God and go towards what is from God. And that could be in any area of life. You know, maybe I work at a place where no one really monitors. Maybe I'm a manager, and you know, when a couple hundred bucks here or there is not a big deal in my pocket. Not a big deal. In fact, you know what? The business I work for, they're, they're making a lot of money. But, you know, I deserve more. I, honestly, I work very hard. And I, I open, I close. I'm, I'm worth more money than I'm getting paid. And you know what? I, wanna, I, I deserve a Palm Springs vacation. If they really knew, they would, they would know. And all of a sudden, it's a couple hundred bucks here, a couple hundred bucks there. No one misses it. Really, it's okay. And all of a sudden, I've got a pattern. And how hard is it to go back and fix that when I'm two years into it with thousands of dollars in my pocket that I've stolen? But it's not stealing because I'm the hardest worker. And we justify it for ourselves. And here you see the people of David's, of David's land say, oh, look at David. He's so amazing. He's taken the widow of Uriah as his own wife. What a hero. What a great guy. Because they're only seeing the, the, the outside not knowing that he actually killed his friend. And then God sends a prophet to David. 2 Samuel 12, 1 and following. The Lord sent Nathan to Daniel. When he came to him, he said... So Nathan comes to David. He's probably out on his terrace enjoying his new, incredibly beautiful wife. 
And Nathan sits down, they're probably having, you know, a glass of wine together. And he says, oh, king, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and one poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, it says. And now remember, David loved the prophets because he loved God. And the prophets were God's prophets. I'm sure that he and Nathan were, you know, on speed dial for the carrier pigeons. They probably, probably sent Nathan gifts. They were probably very close. This was God's prophet. They were buddies. And he says to in verse 3, but the poor man had nothing except for one little lamb he bought. He raised it and grew it up with him and his children. It was like one of the family. He shared his food, drank from his cup, even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man. The rich man who had everything refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare the meal for the traveler who had come to him. And so he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. And David burned. You know, here's David who loves righteousness, who loves what is good, who loves what is right. And he hears about this horrible crime where the man who had everything took the one little thing from the man who had nothing. And he says to David, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. David had a, a righteousness meter that was working, and he knew what was right. But he didn't realize how far he'd compromised. The fullness of what he had done in turning away from God because he desired something that he wasn't supposed to have. Let's go to verse 6. David said he must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and he had no pity. Nathan says to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. God says to us, I have an abundance for you if you'll trust me and walk with me. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck, the, you struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword will never depart from you and your house because you, despised you, because, you, because you despised me. He despised God and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Now let's go to the next verse. You did it in secret, but, but I will do this in broad daylight before all Israel, says God. Let's go to 13. This is a big one. Let's look at this. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. He confessed. He was convicted of what he, of what he, of what he had done. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. Isn't that amazing? Even in the Old Testament, before Jesus when he confesses his sin, as awful as it was, God says, I have forgiven you. And David repented and didn't do that again. I want to talk for us, to us for a, for a minute here about something very important. Taking inventory in our own lives is a really big deal. Taking inventory of where we are in our own lives is a very big deal. We have a, a radar of knowing what is right and what is wrong. Uh, many folks know this, but, but about a year and a half in my ministry here when I started in 08 and um, in, in the middle of 09 and um, before 2010, uh, I, I, I was commuting for 14 months back from here to Arcadia, and, um, and I wasn't home very much, and I began to be aware of the fact that my wife and I were not, were not doing very well. We were not close. Um, and it was hard. And I began to find, my, in my mind, I was thinking about things that I shouldn't be. That person over there is very attractive. I wonder what they're like. And it was actually in a meeting with my mentor, uh, Jim Sillerud, who's a pastor up at, uh, up at um, uh, Granada Hills, First Press Granada Hills. 
he said to me, he said, he said how, are, how is your ministry? We talked about that. And then he said, how, how are things under the hood in your marriage? How are things under the hood? You know it's under the hood, right? Of a car? The engine? The thing that makes it go? And I said, well, yeah, they're, they're fine. And I thought about it some more, and I said, well, they're, they're not really fine. In fact, they're, they're really not very good. And it was at that moment that, moment that I had a, 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 a time of conviction where I said, wait a minute, we're going in a, in a, in a, in a bad direction here. And it was at that time that, that, I, that Beth and I began a counseling process with a counselor out in Granada Hills who was actually incredibly, an incredibly godly woman who really helped us address issues that were being not dealt with. And it's a huge part of our testimony is that when we, we got help and we dealt with those issues and God brought re great reconciliation for us, he, we relit that fire that is so important. And I've talked with pastors who have fallen, or people who have, who have had pastors that have fallen, and I'm telling you, I understand how that can happen if we're not careful. If there is an area of our lives where we are struggling, where we are hurting, where it's not good, we have a responsibility to deal with it. Like this is, I mean, I think this is gospel truth here. If there is an area in our life where we're struggling, where we're not healthy, where, there's, where it's not as it should be, where we're very unhappy, not just in our marriage, but any part of life with God and relationship, we have to deal with these things. It's vitally important. We have to say, God, I am not content with less than the goodness that you have for me. David had an issue that he did not deal with and it desperately wrecked where he was. God says that because you've done this, you're going to have calamity from your own house upon your life. His very own son led a rebellion against him and slept with his wives in public. Really scary, nasty stuff. He did it to, to show that he was going to be the new king in town. This happened because David let his boundaries down and went after something that he should have resisted. He fell into sin. And for all of us in our walk with God, we need to be able to repent and turn away from those things that are not of God. Second Corinthians 5, 18 through 19 says this. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. God's desire is not judgment, but reconciliation. The minute that we turn from that which is not of God, God reconciles us to himself. He brings healing. He brings wholeness. He takes us to the place that he has designed for us to be. John 10.10, 10, that life into the full. But we can't, we can't find it. We can't walk in it if we're still living in compromise to holiness and righteousness. I love David's response when he's convicted. I have done wrong and yet he never turns from God. He continues to seek and follow and find God, and God actually brings healing to him. When we confess our sins and receive God's forgiveness, for, receive God's forgiveness and grace, our lives are brought back into that right place. When that repentance is genuine, when we turn from that which we were in that was, a, that was against God and walk back in line with his call into our lives. When we turn back and we ask for forgiveness, God's mercy finds us with his message of reconciliation and love. That's the gospel truth. But we have to stop. We have to stop compromising in the area of sin. 
Let's pray together. So, Father, thank you for our time in your word today. Lord, I pray that you would put a fire in us for holiness, a fire in us for righteousness, that you would be honored by how we live our lives, and that that would create room for you to move because you are honored in how we live. And we, individually and as a church, we want to experience the fullness, the goodness, the power of your presence. We want to experience the reality of revival as we turn from that which is wrong and engage with you in that which is right. And I pray that today that we would commit to repentance, that we would commit to taking and changing the way that we live, that compromise would, would, would be no more a norm or a pattern for us, but that holiness and righteousness and morality and truth as you define it would become our truth. With grateful hearts, we pray this morning and we thank you, Lord, for your, for your goodness, for your purposes and for your plan for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Help us spread the message. Click on the donate button below or go to shermanoakspc.org forward slash donate. Thank you.